This is coming to you from John Wayne's 26 Bar Ranch in Eager, Arizona. October in 1881, the town of Tombstone, Arizona, was witnessed the most notorious shootout in the history of the West. In a vacant lot at the rear of the OK Corral, City Marshal Virgil Earp and his brothers Wyatt and Morgan, joined by a gambler friend, Doc Holliday, exchanged gunfire with four local cowboys, the Clantons and the McLaurin Three men hurled into eternity in the duration of a moment blared the headlines the first reports of the affair in the Tombstone Epitaph. The duration, in fact, was slightly more than a half a minute. Of the four Earp brothers, James, at 38, was the oldest of the three, hoping to elevate himself from his former trade of bartending and saloon keeping. Wounded in the Civil War, he had a game arm and a passive nature. He was to play no part in the shootout at the OK Corral. Virgil, a solid man of 36, who had been a stage driver in Iowa and Kansas, planned to prospect for silver, or at least find some claims that the Earps could sell for a quick profit. Wyatt Earp, 31, had plans of his own based on experiences so varied as to suggest a distinct ambivalence toward the law. The fourth brother, Morgan, was a hot-headed 28-year-old whose only known prior occupation were those of labor and occasional policemen. The tightly knit Earp clan had a cohort and a friend of Wyatt's from his Dodge City days, John Holliday, an ardent gambler and sometimes dentist. Alcoholic and tubercular at 28, he was a walking cadaver with a flashing temper and a cold-blooded readiness to kill. Wyatt Earp once said of him, the most dangerous man alive. Wyatt and James had come a long way, 750 miles from Dodge City, Kansas, detouring in Prescott, Arizona to pick up Virgil, who had been prospecting there. On the day the Earps hit town, the main street was swarming with prospectors, buying tools, merchants setting up new shops, carpenters erecting storefronts, complete with boardwalk sidewalks in front of each entrance. Confidence men loitered about, waiting to tempt strangers with offers of town lots that had no legal title or shares or mines that had no ore. No doubt they viewed the three long-legged, mustached Earps with expectation, dressed in black frock coats and stiff-brimmed hats, politely helping their wives down from the trail wagons. The brothers looked as respectable as deacons. Virgil had to drop his ideas using law enforcement just as a sideline when a cattle rustler in town for the night casually shot and killed the city marshal. Virgil was asked to occupy the full-time post temporarily, but later his appointment was renewed. Wyatt's original plans were unaffected. He bought into a gambling concession in the fanciest and most profitable establishment in town, the Oriental Saloon, and he also ran the nightly faro game at the saloon across the street, the Eagle Brewery. In addition to his gambling activities, he applied to peace officer's trade, first as a deputy sheriff and later, after his brother Virgil had become city marshal, as an assistant to his brother. The three Arabs were joined in Tombstone in early 1880 by their fourth brother, Morgan. 
Wyatt introduced him to a local Wells Fargo agent, who hired him to ride shotgun on the 11-hour stage run to Tucson. Like Wyatt, Morgan had found periodic employment on a city police force. Doc Holliday came to Tombstone not long after the Earps. Having been slightly delayed in Prescott, Arizona, by a luck at a run of Pharaoh. The Earps soon had enemies, ranchers, cowboys, rustlers, who lived outside of Tombstone. To the ranchers and their friends, some of them who had been second generation inhabitants in the area, the residents of Tombstones were rank newcomers. To Tombstone residents, on the other hand, the men who periodically rode into town were just plain hell raisers. Grown wild on the reins, ready to take advantage at any attempt to constrain them. Moreover, much freer with their guns at night in the saloons. The most troublesome, it turned out, were a set of brothers, the Clantons and the McClowries. They had been friends since the early 1870s, raising cattle along the San Pedro River east of Tombstone before the town was born. The leaders of the ranch ranchers and the cattlemen was old man Clanton. Some fool woman had married him and given him four sons. Clanton's rise to political power came through his favors with Sheriff Johnny Behan. Old man Clanton had quite an organization. He had Curly Bill, Johnny Ringo, Tom and Frank McClowry, Joe Hill, Pony Deal, Jim Hughes, Frank Stilwell, and many other lieutenants who had under them some 400 frontier outcasts who carried out the evil pursuits which dominated human rights all over the southeastern part of Arizona. One day, Johnny Ringo caught the Earps and Doc Holliday as they tried to cross the San Pedro Bridge to hunt down Curly Bill Boches. Ringo stood there with a double-barreled shotgun, telling them, Come on if you want to feel the bite of it. The Earps and Holiday were forced to turn and eat Jim Crow, as they knew Johnny Ringo was no bluff. Doc was a terror when he got mad. Johnny Ringo had showered insults on Wyatt. He went through the streets of Tudenstone with a sawed-off shotgun, shouting for Ringo to come out. Ringo, you dirty coward! Come on out here with your gun smoking! The trouble is just begun. In July of 1881, Sheriff Behan arrested Earp crony Doc Holliday on suspicion of killing a stage driver during an attempted holdup some miles out of town. Big Nose Kate came to Tombstone where she and Doc had a falling out, so she went through the town screaming telling all that she met that Doc had robbed the stage. Doc slapped her down and told her that if he'd have robbed the damn thing, he'd have taken all the gold and still have bungling the job. When Kate sobered up, she told the judge she lied. And Doc gave her some money and told her if she ever come back to Tombstone, he'd kill her. She knew he meant it and never returned. The Earp scored a double hit on the Cowboys and Behan when Virgil, in his capacity as Deputy U.S. Marshal, ordered the arrest of Behan's deputies, Frank Stilwell and a friend of the Clanton, Pete Spence, for holding up the stage. Ike Clanton appeared in court and posted bail for the prisoners. Hearing of the arrest, Frank McClowry also came to town with friends of the Clanton. He were friends of his and by chance they met Morgan Earp on the sidewalk and angrily invited him to step into the middle of the street where Ike Clanton and a few of his companions had collected. As they stood silent, Frank told Morgan, If you ever come after me, you'll never take me. Now a challenge had been issued publicly and the bloody encounter was inevitable. The day before the final encounter, Ike Clanton and Tom McClowry arrived in Tombstone in a wagon. Ike's stated purpose on visiting to Tombstone was pleasure, 
long, solid night in the saloons. Ike began making the rounds early in the evening of the 25th, downing shot after shot of whiskey. At one o'clock in the morning, he walked into the Alhambra saloon, sat down at the table at the lunchroom at the back and ordered something to eat. He didn't notice Wyatt Earp, who had been sitting at the lunch counter, or Morgan Earp, who was standing at the bar beyond it. Then Doc Holliday walked in. Instantly inflamed at the sight of an old enemy, Doc tried to provoke a showdown, then and there. He strode to Clanton's table and snarled. You son of a bitch of a cowboy, get out your gun and go to work. Ike said, I have no gun. The men exchanged words. Wyatt called to his brother Morgan at the bar. Morgan swung his long legs over the lunch counter and took Doc Holliday by the arm and pulled him into the street. Ike rose and followed him. Wyatt, as usual, was more deliberate. He finished his meal, then stepped outside. Doc Holliday was still fuming on the sidewalk. You ain't healed! <coughs> Go heal yourself! Morgan added fuel to the fire. You can have all the fight you want right now. Ike, being handicapped by the lack of a six-shooter, declined and walked off. But he did not go back to the hotel. An all-night poker game in another saloon engaged his attention. At 11.30 that morning, Wyatt was awakened by Ned Boyle, the bartender at the Oriental Saloon who had just met Ike Clanton on the street. Ike had told Boyle, As soon as those damn herps make an appearance on the streets today, the ball will open. Wyatt hurried to the saloon. He'd heard that Ike was now armed with a rifle and a six-shooter and went to search for Virgil. Together they went looking for Ike. The prelude for the shootout had begun. Virgil spotted Ike in an alley and approached him from behind. Ike tried to grab his six-shooter, and Virgil hit him over the head with his revolver, knocking him to his knees. Virgil said, You've been hunting for me? Ike replied, If I'd have been a second faster, I'd have killed you. Virgil promptly arrested him for carrying firearms within the city limits. Morgan Earp arrived at that moment, and the two brothers marched Ike the Justice of the Peace, A.O. Wallace in court. Wyatt went into the courtroom where he found Ike sitting outside the railing, wiping the blood from the side of his head with a handkerchief. Wyatt went past him and sat down on the bench inside the railing to wait the judge. Then he looked back at Ike and said, You've threatened my life two or three times, and I want this thing stopped. You damn dirty cow thief. If you're anxious for a fight, I'll meet you. I'll see you when I get through here. All I want is four feet of ground. Morgan Earp took charge of Ike's rifle and six-shooter, which had been brought in as evidence. Holding the Winchester with his butt to the floor, Morgan taunted Ike by offering to pay his fine if Ike would fight him there and then. I'll fight you anywhere or any way. Without waiting to testify, Wyatt left the courtroom and came face to face with Tom McClowry, who was about to step in and check on Ike. A brief, angry exchange ensued. McClowry said, You want to make a fight of it? I'll fight with you anywhere. Drawing his revolver, Wyatt answered, All right. Make a fight, right here. Then he slapped McClowry in the face with his left hand and brought his right down with the pistol barrel across McClowry's head. McClowry sprawled on the street, glassy-eyed, and Wyatt walked on. Billy Claiborne, a friend of the Clantons and the McClowrys, happened into Tombstone that day. Learning of Ike's arrest, he hurried over to the courtroom. Ike had paid his fine. Claiborne took him over to Dr. Gilliam's office and left him there. A few minutes later, he ran into Billy Clanton and Frank McClowry. They were newly arrived in town, and he told him of the news. 
Billy Clanton was plainly aggravated over his brother's latest fix. Billy told Ike. I want Ike to go home. I didn't come to fight anybody and no one wants to fight me. In a few more minutes, Ike came along with his head bandaged. Get on the horse and go home. Billy demanded. Ike reassured him. I'm going directly. Together the men headed for Brer's Market on Fremont Street. At that moment, Sheriff Behan was getting a shave in the barbershop on Allen Street, near 4th. From where he was sitting, he could see a crowd collecting at the corner. Wyatt and Morgan were standing with Doc Holliday. Virgil lingered nearby, holding a shotgun in his side. The barber remarked that it looked like it was going to be trouble, for sure, between the Earps and the Cowboys. This was the first that Behan had heard of today's developments. He hurried outside and told Virgil that he intended to disarm the cowboys if the Earps would give him a few minutes alone with them. The Earps remained where they were. And shortly after Behan left, somebody reported that the cowboys were on Fremont Street and still armed. The Earps started off. This ain't your fight. There's no call for you to mix in. Doc told Wyatt. That's a hell of a thing for, <coughs> for you to tell me. He was offended. Wyatt was the best friend he had in the world. Virgil paused and then deputized Doc on the spot. He took Doc's cane and gave Doc back his sawed-off shotgun, telling him to carry it under his coat. And the four men resumed their march corner of 4th Street, they looked down Fremont. They saw the Clantons and the McClowries. Frank McClowry had his horse bridle in his hand. And on the sidewalk on the far side of Camulus Fly's place, which was a combination photo gallery and lodging house, Sheriff Behan was trying to persuade them to surrender up their guns. Ike Clanton insisted that he wasn't armed, a fact that Behan confirmed by feeling around his waist. Tom McClowry threw open his vest to show that he was also unarmed. Billy Clanton and Frank McClowry were wearing six shooters. And a rifle hung in the scabbard on Frank's horse. Behan said, Boys, you must give me your arms. Frank said, Not unless you disarm the Earps. Behan ordered the cowboys, Stay here. Sheriff Behan headed toward the approaching Earps. He met them under the awning at Third and Market. Earp, for God's sake, don't go down there. I'm going to disarm them. The Earps and Doc Holliday pushed past Behan. Behan shouted. Go back. I'm the sheriff of this county. And then hurried after them. As the Earps and Doc Holliday reached Fly's place, the Clantons and the McClowries backed into a vacant lot next to it. The Clantons and the McClowries lined up with their backs to it, with Frank McClowry's horse beside him. The Earps moved a few steps over. Virgil, holding Doc's cane in his right hand, stood in front. Behind him was Wyatt and Morgan, and behind them was Doc in length, and you could see it as it blew in the wind under his coat. As the two groups eyed each other across a distance of no more than six feet, Sheriff Behan slipped off to the side of Fly's house, where he was joined by a cowboy friend, Billy Claiborne. Without realizing it, the Clantons had and the McClowries had boxed themselves in. The Earps blocked the front of the lot and the fly in the Hayward house blocked it on the sides. Only the back of the property offered room for maneuvering. Behind it lay more vacant property and the open stalls of the OK Corral. A stubby strip of land about 20 feet wide. There was no evasive tactics, no place to hide. They were past the point of no return. The cowboys took the initiative. In the silence, a click-click could be heard as Billy Clanton and Frank McClowry 
cocked their holstered six shooters. Virgil Earp yelled out, Hold it! I want your guns! Then somebody shouted, Son of a bitch! Clanton leveled his pistol at Wyatt, holding it at arm's length. Wyatt ignored him and whipped out his six shooter out of his. And fired at Frank McClowry, known to be the best marksman of the four cowboys. Billy missed his shot, but Wyatt did not. Shot in the stomach, Frank McClowry staggered into the street. Seeing his brother hit, Tom McClowry drew up in his vest and shouted, I am nothing! Then he reached in vain for the rifle on the scabbard of Frank's horse. Billy Clanton was next to be hit. A target of Morgan Earp's six-shooter. One bullet struck Billy through the right wrist. The other one struck him in the chest. But even as he sat there with his legs crossed, he continued to fire. By now, Billy's brother was trying to save his own skin. Just after the first shot were fired, Ike had lunged at Wyatt. Whether in hope of wrestling Wyatt's weapon or to urge him into a truce is unclear. Seeing that Ike had no gun in his hand, Wyatt coolly pushed him away, saying, or get away. Ike ran off toward Fly's front door. Got out of a shotgun blast after him, but he made it inside, untouched. Almost at once, Ike came out the back door of Fly's place and disappeared behind the stalls of the OK Corral. He didn't stop running until he had reached the Mexican dance hall on Allen Street. Doc took aim at Frank McClellan and fired at him. Doc's shotgun had failed him with Ike. Not so now. Virgil felt a bullet tear through his calf. Frank McClary, despite his stomach wound, he tried to get a rifle from the scabbard on the frightened animal. McClary then drew his six-shooter. Doc had discarded the empty shotgun for his own pistol. As the two men fired simultaneously, third shot came from the left. But his own shot had pierced Doc Holliday's hip. Billy managed to hit Morgan in the shoulder. Billy tried to get to his feet. Morgan and Wyatt fired together. Hit below the ribs, Billy slumped down again. Suddenly, the shooting stopped. Fly came out of his house and went to where Billy Clanton was lay dying, still trying to cock his six-shooter. Fly pulled the pistol from his weakened grasp. The gunfight was over. Of the eight participants, three were dead, three were wounded, and two, Ike Clanton and Wyatt Earp, were without a scratch. The whole gunfight had taken less than a minute. Out of the 17 shots fired by the Clantons and the McClowries, there were only three hits, while of the 17 shots fired by the Doc Holliday and the Earps, there were 13 hits. Tom and Frank McClowry and Billy Clanton were killed. But Virgil, Morgan, and Doc Holliday were only wounded. For weeks, Tombstone debated the question of guilt or innocence. The coroner's jury rendered no clear verdict. After the inquest, Sheriff Behan jailed Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday on charges of murder. Virgil and Morgan were still recovering from their wounds and were not arrested, although Virgil was suspended as town marshal. At the end of 30 days of testimony, the judge decided that the defendants had been justified in their acts. The case was heard by Magistrate Judge Well Spencer. They were, he ruled, officers in charge of arresting and disarming brave men who were experts in the use of firearms. Just two months after the shootout, Virgil Earp, now back on his feet and recovered, was blasted with buckshot as he crossed Fifth Street in the dark. The attackers got away without being seen. Virgil's arm was shattered. Three months later, on Saturday night, in March of 1882, Wyatt and Morgan Earp were at a billiard hall on Allen Street. 
As Morgan bent over the billiard table with his cue, two shots were fired through the glass of the back door. Morgan fell. His spine was shattered by a bullet. <laughs> he was dead. Witnesses say they saw three men running from the scene. Two of them were Pete Spence and the Clanton's friend, Frank Stilwell, Sheriff Behan's deputy. The third man was reported to be an Indian. Three days later, Virgil and his wife boarded a westbound train to take Morgan's casket to California, where the Earp's parents had settled. Wyatt and Doc went on to guard Virgil as far as Tucson. As the train stopped in the Tucson station, Frank Stilwell was spotted, armed with a pistol. Next morning, a trainman found Stillwell dead, six bullets through his chest and both legs. Wyatt and Doc were on their way back to Tombstone. When Wyatt got back to Tombstone that night, he gathered together a posse of friends to hunt down Pete Spence and the anonymous Indian who had killed his younger brother. Next morning, March 22nd, Wyatt found and killed the Indian. Pete Spence himself escaped Wyatt's wrath. At the Iron Spring, he came upon Curly Bill as he was squinting at him through a barrel of a sawed-off shotgun. With the explosion, Wyatt felt his coat jerk back as a buckshot. Wyatt let go of a double-barreled load of buckshot from the Wells Fargo gun, and 18 buckshot almost tore Curly Bill in two. Sheriff Behan and his deputy were roaming the hills in pursuit of Wyatt and Doc Holliday. About a week later, weary and saddle sore, they dismounted in Albuquerque, New Mexico, beyond the reaches of the Arizona law. Yeah. Doc Holliday went on to the high country in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. They died at the age of 35, and pale and thin, too weak to lift the plane car. Wyatt went on to San Diego, California, and went into the real estate business. Then on to Alaska, where he opened up the Dexter out. Saloon. Finally, with his third and final wife, Josephine, he came back to Arizona along the Colorado River at Parker. Although he had some 100 shootouts, he died with his boots off the ripe old age of 81. For Tombstone, it was over at last. Tombstone, Arizona is still very much alive. The town was too tough to die. Gunfighters, gunfighters, give the devil one more try. They never knew what hit them when an ambush was at hand and they never saw their life blood dripping slowly on the sand. This was brought to you from John Wayne's 26 Bar Ranch in Eager, Arizona.